Heading into the presidential election on November 3rd, the U.S. economic outlook is one of growing financial and social imbalances. Several of these imbalances have the potential to delay, disrupt, or destroy the recovery from recession brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Regardless of the election's outcome, the nation faces massive treasury debt and swollen central bank balance sheets. Consequently, fiscal and monetary policymakers have too few tools at their disposal to put the economy back on a path to prosperity. The choices these authorities make now will have implications for many years. John Foley, the U.S. editor for Reuters Breaking Views, will lead the discussion today on reviving the U.S. economy. Use the QA box to lobby your questions to John and our panelists, and they'll try to take them throughout the, dis the discussion. And at the end of the session, I'll come back and share more information. John, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, welcome, everybody. First thing, just to check, can everyone hear me? OK. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm guessing the smile is yes. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to have two um, insightful, experienced speakers today. Um, obviously, as you know, that this week's presidential debate has been sadly cancelled. So I know that there is a gap in the market for smart, civilized conversation about crucial economic policy issues. And uh, the two speakers we've got today are definitely going to provide that. I'll give them a quick introduction and then we'll, uh, we'll head straight into it. Um, Stephanie Kelton, uh, who's coming to us now from Long Island, New York, um, is a professor of public policy and economics at Stony Brook University. She's also, of course, an authority on modern monetary theory, which if you haven't come across it, then I don't know where you've been for the last couple of years. But basically, um, and Stephanie, you can correct me uh, later if I mischaracterize it, but it's the idea that governments who are in control of their own currency shouldn't be afraid to spend whatever it takes as long as inflation is under control. Stephanie's also um, advised um, Bernie Sanders on his 2016 and 2020 presidential campaigns and recently was involved in drawing up uh, some policy suggestions for the Democratic Party as part of a unity task force on the economy. So welcome, Stephanie. Andrew Ullman is a partner at Mayor Brown uh, in DC. Uh, you may, though, also know him from such blockbuster legislation as Dodd-Frank uh, and the CARES Act, which unlocked more than $2 trillion of spending in response to the coronavirus pandemic early this year. That's just some of the legislation that he's helped to shepherd through um, in his years of working with the Senate and at the White House. So until June, Andrew was the Deputy Director for the National Economic Council, and he oversaw the nomination of financial regulators, including the current Federal Reserve Chair, Jay Powell. So Andrew, thanks for being with us today. Um, I would love to um, start off uh, by zooming in to where we are now and then maybe taking a step back and looking at the big picture. Uh, so at the moment, we've got 20 days to go till the US presidential election. Uh, we're bang in the middle of a huge multi-directional tug of war over whether America is going to get any more stimulus. Uh, some Democrats want $2.2 trillion. The Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell wants about a quarter of that. President Trump says that he wants more than either of them do. Um, and the risk is that if no one can agree, we're going to end up with nothing. So. Um, I want to open by asking you, Stephanie, when you look at all of this, um, this mess and disagreement, what is the priority right now? And is there a way out of this logjam? Well, good morning, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to join you this morning. Um, you know, you, the word you used is interesting, right? Opportunity. Uh, there, are, There is definitely an opportunity, and I think there is a clear way forward. Um, the frustrating thing uh, for me is both that, you know, we have apparently now uh, Congress deciding not to act, and we sort of have the benefit of foresight in this moment, in the sense that we can get a pretty good sense of how things are going to unfold in the months and possibly even years ahead if we don't get the kind of continued fiscal support that I think uh, this economy needs now and is going to continue to need 
in the months and years ahead. So we're at a point where the pace of the economic recovery is slowing, where you know we've already seen one in five workers today who is either unemployed, underemployed, or has seen uh, uh, suffered a cut in their pay since the pandemic began. Food banks in many parts of the country remain overwhelmed. The incidence of food insecurity is soaring, especially in Black and Latino households and among families with children. You've got some 40 million Americans who are at risk of eviction. More than half of all small businesses anticipate closing their doors for good. You got coronavirus cases spiking in parts of the country, um, areas beginning to go back into some form of lockdown, deadly wildfires raging across much of the West Coast. I mean, you know, we're looking at a situation, I think, where uh, this economy desperately needs the income support that only really fiscal policy can provide or we really do run the risk of something much uglier unfolding in the months ahead in terms of a potential wave of bankruptcies, foreclosures. You know, we talk about a K-shaped recovery and there is a real danger in my view that we could kick the leg out from under the K and end up back in a situation where the economy is uh, back in a real downward spiral. Andrew, how do you think about this? Because you you help to, as I said, you help to shepherd through the CARES Act, mm -hmm. um, which can't have been a simple task. And and I guess the question is why why has a sequel to that been so hard to to engineer? And what like what's changed in the way that policy is made between then and now? Yeah. Uh, a couple things. Um, the most important of which I think is the election. I think that is a very complicating factor for lawmakers uh, to work around. And there's clearly been some delays uh, because of that. I also think um, the other factor was, is it over the summer, there was, it was unclear which way the economy was gonna go. And so as part of the negotiations uh, to follow up CARES Act, um, there was, in my view, an appropriate um, breathing uh, point uh, space where uh, lawmakers and administration could watch how the CARES Act was was being implemented, how it was being uh, impacting the economy, and then now and then at once it was clear that additional support was going to be needed, have a better sense of where fiscal support needed to be targeted. I think it, you've seen for a while over the summer both. Uh, House and Senate and the administration have really uh, centered on very similar um, pr uh, policy prescriptions going forward. Um, and that uh, there's not, it's one of, of, of kind, uh, not of, uh, one, it's a, the difference here is really about the, the numbers and how much support, because most of the major areas of, um, uh, of, uh, of policy are, are, are basically agreed to by both sides. So how does it, that, in that case, why are we still yeah. so far, do you think, from from an agreement? Because it seems, it's almost like the tail wags the dog, the details get in the way of the bits of, yeah. on which everyone does kind of agree. I mean, on the positive side, if you look at the numbers we're at, I mean, these are these are very large bills that, they're, that all sides have proposed. You know, just for scale, remember the Obama uh, stimulus bill back in 2009 was under a trillion dollars all in, right? Already with CARES Act, CARES Act score is a little more than two trillion in and of itself. With Federal Reserve facilities um, uh, that use some of that money, you know, leverages to about five trillion. So the amount of support already provided just dwarfs what was done ten years ago. Um, so that's that's kind of on the positive side. Um, and so I think where lawmakers are now is like that's a lot of money that's already gone in. I think you have seen some Republicans ask, well, listen, let's if we're going to spend another trillion, let's make sure we know where we're spending it and make sure it's being used uh, most effectively, particularly on those most uh, impacted. But, you know, really, if you look at the numbers, we're not that far off on where a deal likely could be on. And that's why I think it all comes down to whether or not, you know, um, the Congress will allow the president to sign a big bill right before the election. I think there is certainly some gaming about whether or not on the Democrat side, it's that they would prefer just to write it themselves, 
in the first quarter if they win the election. You know, I think it's, they're going to be disappointed in how the election goes out on that, that front, in my view. But that's some of the, 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 the tactical considerations, which is normal yeah. in, this, in this part of policy making. You know. Although not terribly helpful for those of us who are waiting No, it's not, not. As you can tell, I'm very supportive of additional support. I mean, CARES Act has been very successful because, um, in contrast to the way the TARP bill was done 10 years ago, it focuses most of the resources on those who really need the support, you see the unemployed, uh, workers making less than 75,000, on the entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and small businesses, you know, with, uh, with the PPP program, um, and making sure that our entrepreneurial class doesn't get wiped out um, is part of um, uh, the response to, to COVID. And we know if our small businesses and entrepreneurs can make it through this uh, cr uh, crisis, uh, when the economy starts to recover, having them in place and the, um, those businesses ready to rebound, the, re the recovery will go be much, much faster. We saw without that support lab 10 years ago, it really did slow uh, the economic recovery. Right. So that, which, which sort of positions us quite nicely to kind of to take a bit more of an Olympian view and, and think about what's going to happen after, after that election and after the next inauguration. So, um, so let's say we're in, it's 2021, we've got the new or the old president sits down um, to, uh, to to kind of draw the list of, of what needs to be done. Um, so, Stephanie, when the when the when the president gets together with his economic team, what kind of let's assume we don't get a stimulus deal, what kind of economy is he going to find, and what should be top of the list of things to do with it? Well, I mean, to, to a large extent, what kind of economy the next president is going to preside over depends you know, in important ways on the behavior of the virus itself, on the behavior of consumers, but also importantly on the behavior of Congress. And, you know, I, I do think it's important to note that the Democrats were not looking to just push this thing off until after the election when they could write their own bill. They, the House teed up the HEROES Act what was it, four months ago? That was, they were prepared to do another $3 trillion four months ago. It was the Senate that refused to take up that bill. And, and you know, as we've just heard, there was some belief that somehow the CARES Act was itself likely to be sufficient and that Republicans were prepared to sort of wait and see whether any additional support was going to be necessary. Now it looks um, increasingly likely that we're not going to get what what we need, which is another relief package passed. And so the answer to the question, I think, is that the next administration is going to inherit a real mess, a, an economy that is rapidly deteriorating in the face of congressional inaction. Um, as I said earlier, mounting evictions, job losses, you're already beginning to see it with large corporations announcing uh, tens of thousands of layoffs. We know what's happening, what's coming down the pike with the airlines. Those layoffs are beginning. Uh, you know, people, there, there's going to be a foreclosure crisis. You've got a lot of people who uh, owe money who were told, well, you know, you can hold off on making those payments but they're accumulating, they didn't go away. We didn't cancel the debt, we deferred the payments. And at some point, those bills will come due. And then I think the real risk is that, you know, people will not have the cash flow. businesses, small and large individuals uh, who are just not able to stay current. And then the real mess comes when this thing bleeds over into the financial system. How do you, how do you square with that, the, some of the, some of the uh, comments that we're hearing from, say the say the big Wall Street banks who are reporting earnings this week, um, also the IMF actually that had its World Economic Update um, yesterday, I think, because a lot of these a lot of the forecasts are still pretty hideous, but they're less hideous. So there's this kind of seizing on, well, you know, GDP is going to fall 4.4 percent in the U.S. next year, but it was that's better than the 5.2 percent we thought it was going to fall before, or you know, credit credit conditions aren't as bad as we thought they would be because it seems like there's a risk that we take not as bad as we thought it could be um, and treat that as if it means everything's actually okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think, you know, I, most of the important uh, forecasts that I've seen, whether from the IMF or the World Bank or whatever, the, the outlook to me appears fairly rosy. I mean, I think most of them still anticipate 
some sort of a strong bounce back, not just in the US, but across advanced and emerging and developing markets. This is sort of a, a global glitch that somehow the entire world is going to escape in the matter of uh, a year or uh, really in a, in, a, in a year, we get a pretty quick turnaround. So, you know, my, my own view is that uh, it is. It seems to me likely that we're going to see happen what happened in the wake of the financial crisis and the uh, slow anemic recovery that followed, and that is that you get downward revision after downward revision. Suddenly, your your optimism begins to wane, and reality sets in. You say, "Well, okay, growth isn't going to be quite as strong as what we've projected." So, a downward revision followed by another, followed by another, and the next thing you know. You're looking in the rearview mirror at seven to ten years of lackluster economic performance. We run the real risk of confusing a rebound in the labor market with a genuine economic recovery, which I don't think is underway. Andrew, how do you see that? Is that a fair comparison with the financial crisis or post-financial crisis era? Well, I think these are these are very different uh, scenarios, um, yeah. and that's why I think the outcome here could be very different. Um, I think the 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 pessimistic uh, scenario I just outlined is definitely a possibility, um, but that largely depends on the, the length of the pandemic and you know additional spikes. Uh, remember, this is not a crisis uh, occurring from the uh, economy in a, itself. Like the the negative, the adverse reaction that we're seeing in the economy is from the public health crisis that countries are experiencing right now. You know, if the pandemic is brought under control, I think you could, you could see a, a pretty fast recovery and rebound. The U.S. economy was very healthy, remember, a year ago. We had record rates uh, of, of employment, unemployment across all demographics. Uh, was at historic lows. We'd seen wage growth uh, grow uh, across all um, per percentiles of the economy, particularly lower end uh, wages were growing at the fastest rate um, that we'd seen in a, in a long time. And so the underlying health of the economy was very good as we entered this, the, the, the pandemic. So that, that's why I think the CARES Act and having a follow on here is important to keep the, those businesses uh, on, so, uh, give them the support they need to get through this, this really unique time. And unlike in 2008, where you had a lot of bad mortgages um, that were sitting on the books of, of the um, of the banks that just took a lot of time um, to uh, uh, work out and to get those losses kind of flushed through the system. So far, we don't have that. You know, the CARES Act has made sure people have been paying their bills. Mortgage rates are up, but not nearly at the rate we'd seen before. And um, you can see that um, you don't have the buildup in the, the financial system that would impede uh, a fast recovery, unlike what we, we did last time. So there is a potential for a sharper recovery, uh, uh, depending on the speed in which the public health situation is, uh, is addressed and behind us. That's what makes this such an unusual um, a case here, right? Um, in almost every other um, you know, post-war economic downturn, it's been because of something in the economy or an external shock, oil prices, interest rates, um, uh, a banking crisis. Um, and those, um, you know, those are very different types of shocks to an economy than what we're dealing with right now. And that's why the response is different. It's larger, um, you know, the adverse um, selection of moral hazard issues you run into in policy making in, the, in like say 2008, a financial crisis are not present here, <clears throat> which I think expands the tool toolkit uh, considerably. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we still have the pandemic that has to be addressed before the economy can get back to back to normal. Right, and the, and the fact that everything, as you both say, is so contingent on what happens to the pandemic makes mm -hmm. everything a bit, it means that the, the parts move around quite a lot. But one of the things that, I, that does strike me, I, I feel like in this electoral cycle, Certainly on the like on the Republican side, I don't feel like I know very much about what the economic agenda is for, for the Republicans in 21. And I'm not sure that Trump, who's obviously been talking about lots of other things, like, for example, the, the pandemic in China, mm -hmm. for example, like what, beyond the, the stuff about China, what, what do you feel is the Republican platform going forward? For, for fin financial services or the economy more broadly? Well, for the economy more broadly. Yeah. Yeah, well, listen, I think what you'll see is can you focus on making sure the United States remains the most competitive jurisdiction um, in, in the world? So what does that mean in policy? It means infrastructure. I think the president's been very committed to having a large infrastructure bill 
uh, to make sure that the United States not only has world-class highways, uh, ports, uh, air airports, but also uh, our digital infrastructure is world-class. The deployment of 5G can continue to be um, uh, move along smoothly. I think that's been a priority since uh, the early days of, of his presidential campaign. I think there's strong support uh, in the Congress, bipartisan support, for taking on infrastructure in the United States uh, as a, a priority for next year. Um, so I think that's top of the list. I think you'll see continued focus on uh, issues of like permitting reform, making it the, the, the bu bureaucratic process for conducting business in the United States smoother, easier to do, faster to get decisions uh, on permits from, from governments, which has been a major obstacle for economic growth in the United, in the United States. And you'll also probably see some additional reform on the tax side and simplification, uh, making sure that our, our tax code is still remains the most competitive in the world. So those are those are some areas that I could well I very likely expect uh, uh, the administration would tackle next year. Right, and so because I mean, infrastructure stuff, and I, I'm going to ask you, I'm, I'm deliberately going to ask you this mm -hmm. before I ask Stephanie it. But we, we've got at the moment, uh, I think the Congressional Budget Office just said we we've, we've got a 3.1 trillion dollar fiscal deficit for 2020, yeah. um, which is and as a share of GDP, that's the highest we've had since 1945. Yeah, um, since the war. Yeah. For, since the war, so so as a when you, when you think about spending and infrastructure, obviously is is always contentious and always involves large sums of money. Yeah. Is that really com unless you take the kind of MMT perspective, which we'll get to in a minute, and, yeah. and I'd love to hear more about from Stephanie. How how are those things compatible? Yeah, well, first of all, a lot of transportation, remember, is kind of a user pay system in the United States, where either. Um, uh, uh, People who say driving pay a gas tax uh, to finance the roads, uh, or you know localities who in the United States remember do you know the vast vast majority of infrastructure spending is done by localities, and so the federal government largely partners with them, um, but creates incentives to make sure that that there's a appropriate fiscal balance there. So it's not you know you know when you hear the size of these bills, it's not as if it, when you see our you know, one trillion dollar infrastructure bill. That doesn't mean they're not offsets as part of that. There are a lot of offsets that are already built in the, the uh, establishing infrastructure um, uh, uh, system that will offset a fair amount of that. The other piece too is this is remember these bills um, that you know the president's talked about are five to ten year bills, and you know there's some real value in having that amount of money spent over that period of time too. I think that's often lost lost in these conversations is that infrastructure in the United States for many years has been done uh, on a two to four year um, uh, authorization. And that uh, actually makes it sometimes more expensive and also more difficult to do appropriate infrastructure planning. You know, the original highway bill that Eisenhower did, you know, is very famous for uh, really connecting the United States and giving the United States a world-class uh, highway system uh, was authorized for 13 years. Um, so those types of, that, you know, that would be an unprecedented bill to be able to pass, pass today. Um, but when you start looking at the numbers over that period of time, I think it becomes more, more, more feasible, uh, and also more realistic on what the needs are uh, to matching, uh, matching the needs of U.S. infrastructure. So I think in this area, certainly the deficit is an issue, and you know, Congress has had some problems covering, uh, making uh, infrastructure bills be fully paid for, and that will be an issue. But there are some that you know, right now. Remember, interest rates are at record lows. Um, and those are some pretty good investments for the, for the federal government to make right now. Stephanie, is that and is that infrastructure spend an idea you can get behind? And can you can you can you tell us why we shouldn't be scared of these giant three point one trillion dollar deficits? Well, sure. I mean, I, I've been behind infrastructure for a, a, a great many years. I mean, this is a, an area where it just clearly makes sense that, you know, we've deferred maintenance. Uh, you know, I, I pay attention to that report that comes out every two years from the American Society of Civil Engineers, where they sort of take a look at the whole of America's infrastructure, everything from wastewater uh, treatment to ports and rails and hospitals and schools and bridges and 
roads and everything, and they grade the infrastructure, and then they put a number on the deficiency. They tell us exactly how much money we ought to be spending to bring our abysmal uh, report card grade of a D plus or whatever it is at the moment up to something that's passing grade. And I've watched that number climb from 1.3 trillion to 2 point something to 3.1 to 3.7 to 4.3. In other words, this is a problem that's compounded over time because we ignore it. We just let the uh, deferred maintenance pile up. Absolutely, we have to take care of our infrastructure. We should modernize it. Uh, we should repair what's broken and we should be upgrading and modernizing so that we get more resilient climate uh, related improvements and so forth. So yeah, sure, of course. Do I think that the permission slip to take action is um, tied to this low interest rate environment? No, I do not. Uh, I, it isn't the case. I would not make the argument that now is the time to do infrastructure because it's cheap and we can borrow cheaply. We should have done it 10 years ago, independent of where interest rates were. Um, does the amount of spending and the fact that it would increase deficits concern me? No. And the reason is that I just view deficits themselves fundamentally differently from just about everybody, apparently. So when I hear the word fiscal deficit, I don't think of something, I don't think of it as a problem that needs to be solved. It is not evidence of you know, fiscal malpractice. It's not evidence that the government has mismanaged its finances. The deficit is this thing we unfortunately refer to as the deficit is simply the difference between two numbers, right? One of the numbers is how many dollars is the government spending into the economy on some period of time, fiscal year or whatever, and how many dollars is it subtracting out of the economy, mostly in the form of taxes? That's all it is. So what we refer to as a fiscal deficit or a government deficit is nothing more than a financial surplus that is being deposited into some other part of our economy. In other words, if the government spends $100 into the economy and only taxes 90 back out, its deficit is 10. We write a minus 10 on the government ledger, and then we say, oh, that's terrible. The government's budget is in deficit. But we forget that there's a plus 10 now. Somebody's sitting on $10 in some part of the economy. Every deficit is good for someone. In financial terms, the government's deficit is the financial surplus that appears in some other part of our economy. So for me, the question is, you know, for whom and for what? Where is that $10 going? And for what purpose is that deficit being run? Are we doing investments in our infrastructure, in R&D, in education, in the kinds of things that enhance our economy's long run economic productivity, that's a great way to make deposits in the economy. But I don't have any particular interest in the number that falls out of the budget box at the end of each year. It doesn't tell me anything important. What I'm concerned about are the real effects of the government's fiscal policies, both on the tax and spending side. What are those deficits helping us to accomplish in the real economy? Got it. And, and is it right to say that also the other question that you're asking is, to what extent are they likely to cause inflation? So the inflation should be the break effectively on that spend, spending. Yeah, so in, in the current environment, there is enormous opportunity, right? Because if you wanted to undertake a large scale uh, public infrastructure program, back in the fall of 2019, that's a very different economy. That's an economy, as we just heard, that uh, had very uh, labor markets that were much tighter, right? We were much closer to what we might call full employment. And so the constraints were very different then. Now we're in an economic environment where unemployment is quite high, where businesses are desperate for customers, where factories are idle or running well below their potential capacity, which means there is ample fiscal space available to government to spend dollars into the economy without the need to subtract any back out. The purpose of subtracting the dollars back out isn't to so-called pay for the government spending, it's to offset the potential inflationary impacts of that spending. So you can't do a $4 trillion infrastructure program, maybe even over four or five years if it was spread out, if the economy is already at full employment. You'll simply, re you'll bid up prices and create bottlenecks and inflationary pressures. In an economy like the one we have today, 
we could easily um, have Congress, you know, commit to spending significant um, sums, trillions of dollars on infrastructure investment, roll that out safely over the next four or five years and not need to worry about, you know, offsetting all of that spending in the conventional pay-go sort of way. So if you have a situation as we do now where inflation is elusive or high inflation, you know, anything above 2% is kind of just a pipe dream at the moment, really. Um, how, what's to, what's to, what kind of checks and balances do we have to make sure that the spending that does happen is good spending? Because you, presumably Congress is the, is the body that decides whether to spend or not spend. Um, and if, we, if, we, if we're not constrained by absolute numbers, a trillion, 10% of GDP or whatever, then then there's not really any reason to not just spend on whatever takes our fancy. If Congress either can't make decisions or it just seems to blindly follow whatever the president wants to do, how do we make sure that that way of thinking about deficits that you encourage us to, to follow doesn't just result in spending on all the wrong things? Well, all right. So you, you rightly note that Congress has the power of the purse and in whatever Congress votes for, that is the authorization for the spending to take place and the spending will take place. So if Congress got together and said, let's just send everyone $4,000 a week, you know, until we feel like stopping, they can do that, okay? But what we're talking about is more targeted, more um, thoughtful kind of investment in this moment in this economy. So the question is, you know, if you, if you can agree that there is a certain amount of fiscal space available. And we would, you know, presumably turn to economists and others for help in assessing how much fiscal space is available to Congress. And we say, look, you folks have about four and a half trillion dollars of non-inflationary fiscal space out there. Now you have to decide how to prioritize your spending or tax, right? Whatever your agenda is. This is how much we think can safely be done over the next two, three, four years. Uh, and now it's up to you to prioritize. And then you're held accountable by the American people, right? If, if this Congress said, all right, we're gonna use that $4 trillion in fiscal space to do massive tax cuts that look very much like the tax cuts that were passed at the end of 2017. I think the American people would probably uh, rightly be pretty enraged that that's how Congress chose to use that fiscal space. On the other hand, if Congress said, we're gonna do you know, a, a jobs program, we're gonna do infrastructure, we're gonna do healthcare or education, we're gonna make investments in the greening of our economy, then I think you know, you're, you're gonna have much more public support for those sorts of investments. But at the end of the day, it is, Congress does have uh, the ability to steer those dollars in the direction that it chooses. We can use agencies like the Congressional Budget Office to help guide lawmakers to, um, you know, give feedback on proposed spending bills that say this is this is a particularly good bill because it would lead to more job creation, lower inequality, lift more people out of poverty. You know, we, we can provide the kind of feedback that helps them prioritize um, different kinds of investment projects. Andrew, how do you think about this? Because the CARES Act itself was quite experimental in some ways. It's not the kind of legislation that you would necessarily imagine a Republican government would champion, but it did and it worked. So how do you think about this debate about no, I think it, they matter. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, honestly, I view the CARES Act is something that both parties really came together and together to pass for the good of the country. I think they uh, both sides saw that we're facing a pandemic. You now, pandemic is something that government uh, is kind of designed to help respond to. Right, government is here to do the things that the private sector and you know, the uh, markets aren't able to do. And so that's why you saw, you know, the vote in the Senate was 96 to zero. So I think, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's very easy in an election cycle to be very partisan and want to do everything through those lens. But you, I think it's also important to, you know, take a brief moment at times to look and see where the the, the, the common good has been been advanced uh, through policymaking. And I think the CARES Act is definitely uh, falls into that category. And that's that's a good thing that, that the government uh, has done. And uh, I think it's helped millions of people. So, um, and that's why, you know, what I think is unique about it, and I agree with your statement that it is, it's an unusual bill uh, compared to the way we've handled things before, is that it's much more targeted. It's just not spending to spend, 
but it's really focused on those who need the, the assistance the most, those who are most impacted uh, by the pandemic with enough support to make sure that the, the uh, circulatory system of the economy continues and, can, and, and, and the infrastructure of the, of the economy stays in place so that when the pandemic ends, we can have a, have a good recovery. And that's why I think you'll, you'll, you will eventually see Congress passing additional uh, legislation um, uh, to, um, to extend many of the key, key provisions uh, of, the, of the CARES Act. So, um, you know, it's one where I think Congress really, really got it right. Do you think, um, do you think there, there has been a, a, a permanent or at least semi-permanent shift in Republican thinking on some of these things? Because when you think about, say, the, the, you know, the $1,200 checks that were sent to adults below yeah. a certain level of income, um, and they obviously they obviously worked as you uh, you know as you've said they they and they also help make sure that the banking system is in reasonably good shape no because it means that people haven't defaulted on their credit cards. Um, but it, but you know just six months before the CARES Act or, or around then we were listening to like Andrew Yang at the Democratic debates talking about universal basic income and that was that seemed like a, a radical idea. Now those checks aren't universal basic income per se, but but it. It's now we've seen that it works to hand money to people to tide them through and to help them just survive through a difficult period. So, what's that going to do to the the kind of GOP worldview when it comes to to, to handouts, basically? Well, I mean, well, first of all, I mean, let's remember that there's a even before the CARES Act, there's a pretty strong uh, public safety net in the United States that I think you know both parties, you know, at core support and understand the importance. So we've already have a system in there. The question is, you know, uh, what changes would be there, and and how much, um, at what point does that support start to undermine incentives to work and to have a vibrant economy? And I think that was more the discussion, you know, about the um, the the permanent income uh, policy there. And you know, I think that's one for economists to continue to debate and look at. You know, what we're dealing with here is a very different situation, which is, you know, a pandemic where the government had to intervene told people not to go to work, um, the uh, pandemic that forced many businesses uh, to, to close down through no kind of fault of their own or their employees. Um, you know, the response and the, the good public health response required people to stay home. The government has come in here and for those most affected provided support to help them get through this. It's also a, you know, a period of time, you know, hopefully that, you know, will be here, uh, it will be addressed and the economy can get back uh, back to normal and that support can be w w withdrawn and people can re-enter the workforce and start providing uh, you know, working providing for themselves as we as as, norm as normally happens and that government support you know ebbs back to a more tr traditional and also sustainable role and clearly the federal government can pass two trillion two trillion dollar bills every couple months indefinitely um, you know there are there are limits on re on resources there. But, you know, in this period of time, you know, it's certainly proven to be effective. And that's where I think you know, it's very easy to kind of stereotype the, the, the parties. But there's been a lot of, I think, a lot of creative thinking about how to handle this, um, this pandemic by the administration. And, you know, we've got a lot of support from, got a lot of support in Congress to, to advance that. And that's why, again, I think the economy is in far better shape um, than it would have been hadn't we been able to take uh, a lot of these decisive actions over the course of this year. Um, yeah, the, the other, and there's also you said creative thinking, and the other place there's been some creative thinking is the Fed. Of course, they've um, sure. done some pretty um, remarkable things. Jay Powell has basically kept every kind of financial asset, apart from stocks, directly propped up, and you know now we're looking at rates that are going to be um, very, very low until 2022 by the looks of things. What do you what do you make of Powell's contribution to it? Of course, you oversaw the nomination of, of Powell. Well, what do you think so of his contribution? Yeah, I think I, I think the Fed. Uh, remember, the Fed's a, a team too. Like there's the the board right. that votes here. So um, the entire team has been uh, of the board has been fantastic on being uh, understanding the role of the Fed. And clearly, this is a lender of last resort situation uh, that the Fed was designed to to be there for uh, and provide that uh, those lending facilities uh, in a crisis. Uh, what I think is another piece here to note is how fast, um, not only the administration, but the Fed also moved to, to get ahead of this. I mean, the CARES Act was passed uh, in March. I mean, that just shows you how, how serious things were taken so early 
And by then, you know, a lot of the facilities were already uh, up in place. Now they need the funding from Congress um, uh, to really be effective uh, uh, in the long long term. Um, but you know, what was nice is that unlike in kind of uh, 2008, there was a pretty good understanding of what facilities would be needed, how to fund them. Uh, Congress was uh, was willing to provide that critical funding to 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 get those facilities up and and uh, stabilized. So it went very fast, and you know, by the first of April, you know, the um, the major components of that um, uh, of those facilities was in place and, and helping the economy get through the, the worst uh, the worst of so far the the downturn. So I think they've done a, a, a superb job. Do you think the um, do you think the brief for what a Fed chair does, and sort of, and at least sort of the informal brief, has changed? Because Powell's Powell's focused very strongly on this idea that financial policy should be accessible to everyday people. The, the Fed is engaged in these events that they call Fed listens, where they go out to yeah. ask and find out what you know what effect monetary policy is having on real communities. He's also done a pretty good job of rebuffing pressure from um, from the White House and elsewhere when it comes to um, setting his policy. Do you, if you were creating a kind of Frankenstein's monster of a Fed chair today, would they look any different from when you were last doing that exact same thing? Well, I, listen, I think the Fed always has kind of done this role. One is just good public relations and the monetary policy and the role of the Fed in the U.S. economy is a complicated thing. Um, you know, economists are still studying and trying to understand it, you know. Um, and so, you know, for the American public, um, it's an institution that um, they don't uh, often know that much about. And so it's important for the, the public to have confidence, too, as you know, in the Fed. You know, that's a big part of monetary policy and credibility. Uh, in monetary policy, and so the the outreach they do uh, is important uh, there. Um, it's also important um, in Congress, making sure members of Congress understand what the Fed's doing, why uh, why these large sums of money uh, are going to be needed, and um, how they'll, they'll be used uh, uh, appropriately. You now, taxpayer dollars um, are, need to be spent wisely, and I think you know um, Chairman Powell and the rest of his. His colleagues at the Fed have done a good job of communicating, you know, to the public and being very transparent about how these funds are being used. So I see it as really the, it's a very traditional role. If you think about why the Fed was established, is to come in in, in crises like this and provide that support that only the federal government can have, since it has the reserve currency um, and um, uh, ability to, to 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 provide that uh, support. Um, it's just that he's doing it in a context that we haven't seen before, right? A, a pandemic. And so I think they're creative in the sense of taking the tools they have and applying it to the situation. Now, that said, I think every crisis, that's what you, do, you need to do. And that's where policymakers have to be flexible, have to be creative, know the facts of each situation, and tailor their policies uh, accordingly to make sure they're effective and also, again, good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Got it. Thanks. So, Stephanie, thinking about the Fed, this time next year, we'll probably have some visibility on who the next Fed chair will be. Maybe Jay Powell again, maybe someone different. What What are your thoughts on what that person needs to do and be? Because obviously the Fed has a has a very different role when seen through the lens of how modern monetary theory works. Well, I mean, so we heard already lender of last resort. Now, that is obviously a very uh, important and foundational reason for establishing the Federal Reserve. Maintaining an orderly payment system, carrying out all payments on behalf of Congress, on behalf of Treasury, all the payments that are authorized by Congress on behalf of Treasury, that is the government's fiscal agent, the Federal Reserve. So it plays an important role there. Maintaining the liquidity of the system is important. But when you talk about you know, looking ahead, Let's first look back. Let's look back at what the Fed did, developing this so-called unconventional toolkit in the wake of the financial crisis. Because, you know, before then, we really just thought of monetary policy in pretty simple terms, right? The Federal Reserve adjusts the overnight interest rate, and that's how it makes monetary policy. And then we got quantitative easing and forward guidance and some of these other things. Um, looking ahead, what might 
Jerome Powell, or if there were to be another Fed chair, uh, how might things need to change going forward? There are people who say that the Fed should, could and should play a much larger role even now in terms of uh, getting cash to state and local governments. That in some sense, if the Fed's job is to maintain an orderly financial system, and you con you have concerns that the financial system itself is at risk because of inaction on the part of Congress, then the Fed might rightly view that it's in within its purview to take bolder steps in lending directly to state and local governments to ensure that the kinds of layoffs that are definitely coming, if we don't get money to state and local governments, we could see upwards of 5 million additional job losses in the months and years ahead. If the Fed says, wait a minute, uh, full employment is my mandate. And so if I can see that coming down the pike, then I'm going to get more creative with my Section 14-2 uh, authority, and I'm going to start lending directly to state and local governments so as to avoid a spike in unemployment that I can see coming down the pike. I am going to um, do things differently in terms of macroprudential policy with respect to, you know, I think climate change is going to be an issue, and I think there are implications for the economy going forward. So I can discourage brown investment. There are credit things the Fed can do on the credit side. Um, so I think there are a whole range of things that a creative uh, Fed chair could pursue um, in terms of lending, managing credit conditions in the economy, uh, shoring up you know, employment, uh, and so forth going forward. But you, I mean, you have to be willing to get creative, managing the yield curve. They're already doing that in a sense. They're not doing it quite as openly as the Bank of Japan, for example, with yield curve control, but essentially uh, the Fed is making it clear uh, that you know, long-term interest rates are going to remain low. Looking forward, doing everything it can to lean on members of Congress, to lean on lawmakers. I mean, the appeal is there, right? Jerome Powell and uh, many other uh, members of the Board of Governors and Open Market Committee, uh, they have said in no uncertain terms, the Fed can lend, but the Fed can't spend. We can pull our lever, but you know, we can't do what we can't do. And you can spend, and there's a whole lot of help that we're going to need from you, the fiscal partner in this, going forward. And if we end up in a situation where fiscal policy goes AWOL, like it did after the passage of the uh, ARRA, the Afford um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we got that one big bill that we heard about earlier, and then Congress just sort of checked out and left poor Chairman Bernanke to pick up the pieces. And what did he do? He went all in. He just shoved the chips in, open-ended QE, finally, and, and the Fed did what it could, but the Fed can't do what the Fed can't do. do you, one of the things you have argued that the Fed should do, or the, the task force of which you were a member has argued that the Fed should take a more active role in thinking about um, racial inequities, and, and clearly one of the, one of the most stark um, effects of COVID-19 has been to, to, to show us and to widen those racial income and wealth gaps that you see it everywhere. Watching, this, watching the virus play out in New York, it was very clear that some areas of the city were being affected more than others and some income levels, and those mapped also onto racial divisions within the city. Talk, talk to us a bit about how what we can, like what would, what would be your kind of top prescription for, for helping to reduce that inequality, which I think both sides of the political aisle Say, you know, say are, are a problem and a growing problem. And so I would address it primarily through fiscal policy, not through monetary policy. It's fine to say, you know, to have the Federal Reserve recognize that um, its policy decisions do have some impact on things like racial wealth disparities, inequality, and so forth. That's fine. But to ask the Fed to bear any kind of responsibility, primary responsibility for closing, narrowing racial wealth gaps, for bringing the black unemployment rate into line with white unemployment rate. You know, as I said, the Fed can't do what the Fed can't do. Those are problems, in my view, best addressed through fiscal policy, raising the minimum wage, a federal job guarantee, paid family. I mean, we got, I could give you, you know, two dozen uh, policies that I think would help to narrow the racial wealth gap um, narrow uh, black-white unemployment disparities, pay disparities, and so forth. I think what Chairman Powell has done, though, is to say, 
we recognize, we the Fed recognize that the benefits that accrue to those at the bottom, those who have the most difficult time finding employment, even in a good labor market, that those benefits finally trickle down when the Fed is patient and allows the unemployment rate to fall below what you started off talking about, uh, or maybe that was in a previous webinar I did this morning, I forget, the Phillips curve, right? <laughs> that we, don't want to try to, we don't want to try to choke off opportunity before it reaches the people who are most denied advances and opportunity in the labor market. And so that's mm -hmm. important, right? Um, but I really do think that the, the, the real potential for uh, progress here lies on the fiscal, not the monetary side. Mm -hmm. Got it, thanks. And Andrew, I want to take a swerve because we've only got a few minutes left, but um, financial regulation, because that's obviously an easy thing to pack into just a couple of minutes. But you worked, <laughs> on, you worked on the creation of Dodd-Frank, which was a seismic piece of legislation for banks. You also worked on the do-over um, in 2018, mm -hmm. um, scaling back some of those rules, for, particularly for smaller banks. What, what's left undone? What do you, is, is there anything that you look back and you think the next thing to do to the financial regulation system that we have now is... X. What, what would be the thing that you yeah. would take the hatchet to next? Well, uh, well, I would say hatchet. You know, I think, you know, the way we, we went about the reforms the last four years was very targeted and very focused and aimed on tailoring regulation to make sure that it's appropriate for the institution to which it applies and that you don't have regulations that are designed for $2 trillion banks applying to $50 billion banks. You know, there's a there's a big scale there and you don't want to create, you know, barriers to entry and unnecessary costs and denials of services for consumers. So one is I always see it as an evolving situation um, because our economy uh, and financial markets are always evolving. So it's very important to always stay, um, stay attuned to developments. I think one area that this crisis will let us take a, a real good look at, which is liquidity in the markets. There were a lot of liquidity regulations that uh, were imposed um, uh, as in the wake of the uh, financial crisis and as part of Dodd-Frank. But I think it's worth now going back and examining on whether or not they actually did help provide liquidity to the system or if those uh, regulations imposed constraints and uh, made liquidity actually less available during this, this crisis. We know that you know, inventories, a lot of broker dealers have really shifted and changed in the uh, composition and size of the assets they hold and their ability to really be market makers in times of stress. Um, uh, it's really changed. And I think that's a particular area that we need to go back and take a look at the data and see where um, those market making uh, uh, actors were either hindered by regulation or where uh, additional regulations are needed to help them uh, provide that liquidity in a crisis situation. And this provides a very good test case. Um, you know, the government, Actually, and this is also just good on the overall economic response because then it reduces the need for the government to always be there kind of providing that assistance. You know, it strengthens the financial markets and then protects, protects taxpayers appropriately. So I think that's, a, that's one at the top of my list. Got it. Thank you. And I just want to finish off with a, a Wall Street question for you, Stephanie. Um, there's a, there's one, of the, one of the debates happening on, in, in, within the Democratic Party, as far as we can tell, is, is on the role of Wall Street in helping to make policy do you think that there is a role for Wall Street executives in a democratic administration? Oh, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to say that no one who's ever touched Wall Street belongs anywhere near a policy, uh, you know, a position of, of advisory or policymaking position. Um, do I think that it would be wise to... Um, pull the next cabinet, you know, treasury secretaries and continue this sort of revolving door uh, where, you know, we take the chief economist from Goldman Sachs and, and just anoint them treasury secretary uh, every couple of years. No, I don't think we ought to uh, do that. Um, so I know that there's a debate taking place. I'm not participating in that debate. I would like to see, quite frankly, just competent people who have some real world experience, who have some Main Street experience serving in important cabinet and advisory positions. I think too much of the time we end up with people who are so far removed from that world that they fall into this sort of trap of thinking that what's good for Wall Street is good for Main Street and that looking after uh, the big banks and, and Wall Street uh, is, in a sense, the same thing as looking after the economy. And so I think 
um, you know, there are reasons to prefer to, to pull talent from other, uh, other parts of the economy, other industries. Okay, Andrew, I just have to, for the last minute, I just have to hand that back to you because you've spent so much time identifying talent and putting people in high places. <laughs> Uh, I, well, listen, you want to have people with a diverse skill set. You want to put together a team of, of individuals who work well together. I think that's you know, one, one really important lesson. You know, as long as the United States has such a fractured regulatory system, you need regulators who know how to work together. I think we've been, had a, a great result of that. Two is really good um, skill sets of people who are experienced in their areas, you know, experts um, in that particular type of re regulation. Does it have to be somebody great right from Wall Street? No, and you've seen, um, you know, you've seen, uh, you know, in the administration, we've had a very kind of diverse group of individuals at different areas. Some have worked on Wall Street, some haven't. Some have, you know, worked at uh, regional banks, uh, have worked in, uh, you know, investment funds outside of uh, outside of uh, outside of New York. Other people have been largely, you know, public servants their whole career, and I think that diverse mix of of talents and capabilities and backgrounds. Uh, has really helped us have a, a fantastic team, um, and as, as I noted earlier, be able to respond effectively quickly during this crisis. Got it. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank it's you. been a real pleasure having you join us, and thank you for your ideas and your insights. I'm going to hand back to Karen now to sign us off. Karen, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Well, thank Thanks everyone for a really good discussion today. And if you're a client of Refinitiv and follow our news in our ICON or workspace applications, you can access the news as well as other information, um, economic information from data stream, Reuters Real, Real Clear, politics um, um, information, polling information in our US polls app. So it's US polls and you can continue to get information from John uh, and the Breaking Views team, the Reuters News team. Uh, I'd like everyone to know that on Friday, we will continue the discussion on the economy with a LinkedIn Live session. And that will be at 1140 Eastern time on Friday and will feature viewpoints from Mike Dion and economist Jeff Hall. And next week, I'll be leading a discussion with Dr. Richard Peterson on how market sentiment is shaping around COVID and the US elections. We'll examine things like how the media information flow affects our emotions, investor behavior and stock prices, um, and just look at quantitative research and psychology driven market moves um, as a result of, of all of the emotion and sentiment that's happening from the election and everything that's happened since the beginning of 2020, frankly. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us and goodbye everyone.